Hi guys, um, since so many people have asked me how I designed the preludes for the um, current campaign that I'm playing, um, Das Erbe des Schwarzen Eises, I've decided to make a short video to show you how I went about doing it. In another video which I published a couple of days ago, I explained that uh, when I run DSA, and DSA is very different from other games in that the living world has been developed over the last 37 years or so, and it is full of life and um, it continues to grow and to move even when you're not playing. So unlike, for example, when you play Pathfinder and you engage in one of those adventure parts, the um, story unfolds and starts when you start the adventure path and it ends when you end the adventure path, but whatever happens during the story has no impact on anything else. It's very different in DSA and I won't go into any detail because we don't have the time. So. Um, how do I go about um, creating those preludes? Well, um, in this particular Das Erbe des Schwarzen Eises, what happened was I chose four players because I wanted to play with them and I pitched the story to them and I said, you know, would you be interested? And they were like, yeah, that's fine. So the story basically centers around this area of the world. It's in the far north and um, it's just, uh, it's, 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 um, it's taking place shortly after a tyranny of one of the Heptarchs um, <clears throat> has been broken and this lady basically spread black ice all over the northern part of, um, of the continent, so round about here. Um, now this is always under ice, so this is basically the Arctic um, of Aventuria, but she basically made the ice go south further and she turned it black, so it's called the black ice. Um, and so essentially um, <clears throat> there was kind of like a natural gap right around here um, and uh, ignore these things because they are completely wrong. Quirazim is nowhere down here, Quirazim is more up here, so um, this map, I don't really understand why they drew it, because if, if you don't know anything about um, DSA, this, this map is completely ridiculous, but it's the only map that I have that I can show you. Anyway, so um, the idea is that you go from someplace um, in Festum, which is somewhere down here, up to up here, and then explore around here, and things happen up here. Now, what I did was I said, okay, well, you know, um, make a suggestion as to what kind of character we'd like to play. So. One of my players decided that he wanted to play a mage from Lovangen. Now Lovangen is right around here and the story starts right around here. So my task was to find a way to get him from here to here and to make it interesting for him because I can't just get everyone else to go over here, pick him up and then go back and then go north. Um, and, you know, to force him to say, well, you have to have a character that starts here. So somebody who lives in Festum already, because Festum is the town where everything starts. Um, you can do that, of course, but it will actually make things um, a lot more um, railroady. And it will probably be a lot less fun for the characters, uh, for the players, because they can't really create the characters that they want. So I said... The main thing is the world from which I start. So in the world, we have two geographical entities that we kind of have to link. One is over here, one is over here, and we have to find a way for this person to get from here to here. Secondly, we have the adventure, and the adventure has a couple of um, key points that we need to um, think about when we first think of the storyline. So the first one is that we know where the start is. The start is a city called Festum. So we know this is where we need to go. Secondly, we also have a date. And the date is 10.33 after Bosporan's fall. And probably around April. Because you're going to go north. And you're not going to go north in the dead of winter. Because you will probably freeze to death. So it should be at the beginning of spring or mid-spring. So let's say March, April time. So... He told me where he was from, so he sent me a long, um, well, I think two pages of information about his character, about his family, um, and about um, 
what he was like and where he studied and um, what his studies entailed and, you know, that kind of thing. So then my job was to go and find anything and everything I could about Lohwangen. So I went to the relevant um, descriptions in the law. So I took DS, um, DSA 4.1 um, sources because DSA 5.5 uh, 5, um, doesn't really give you anything about Lohwangen. And I also had to check out um, the information about uh, the academy where he was a student. Now, um, the academy, sorry, I think it's 10.36 actually, the academy tells me, information about the academy gives me information about NPCs that are there, that he would have met, um, possible story hooks, maybe um, secrets, etc. And it also gives me information about things he would know, because, for example, they have a very good library, and the library um, contains information about X, Y, Z. So in preparation for going on his quest, he would have access to certain types of information, which I can then give the player up front. I don't have to say, okay, roll on a library, use roll or, or something, or do some research. You know this because it's available to you and you are a scholar, so you would have prepped. And another thing it also tells me is kind of something like a book of days because uh, this academy has um, <clears throat> a calendar of events that happened during the year. And one thing that happened was that the final um, exams are in... September. And that's where I hit the first problem because we're not starting until April. So he has to finish. He has to have finished before we start. So he has finished in 1035 in September because that's when the, ac the academic year ends. But then he has to kill October, November, December, seven months um, between graduating and starting here. Now, this journey will take him around 30, 40, max 50 days. You know, so that's, let's say, two months on the outside if he stops on every single, at every single um, crossroads and talks to every single tree he meets. Two months. So if I go back to April, you know, then we would say, okay, he might have started in, in February or maybe even March because February is still winter. So, you know, let's say March. So March would take him to, to here in April uh, or by April easily. So what does he do in the meantime? That's when I started to develop the idea that he is a very unliked person. He's fat. He's well, this is his own description. I didn't make that up. Um, he's fat, he's, um, he's very intelligent, he's a very good scholar, but he's also very impractical. So he has been dealing with very theoretical parts of magic, um, and lots of people simply, you know, thought that he was too bookish, and he's fat, and, you know, and he eats a lot, and so he wasn't very, very well liked. So I decided that when everyone graduates and moves on, he doesn't. He stays there and he takes the role of, a, of an assistant lecturer. And he works there for a, for a while. Um, and so I basically developed that idea that he works there, that he then also, you know, um, his, his situation has changed. So now he's got pupils who look up to him, scholars um, that will look up to him. Um, and so I, I kind of had this little exchange that there's this one guy who really, you know, he's very young and he really likes what he does. Um, and he has a lot of potential, but he is too young to still understand, to already understand what this guy has been working on from an academic point of view. So he's kind of mentoring him. And then I also thought, okay, well, I need to get him to here. So um, I basically then brought in one of the NPCs that lecture, one of the senior lecturers at the academy and said, okay, well, you know, you've, you've basically, she's, she's somebody who's kind of 
um, disgruntled because she was passed over for promotion and she happens to work in exactly the same area that he wrote his thesis in so basically she's like disgruntled and she basically says yeah you know what well, we're, we're just going to send you on a on a really interesting quest I've been asked um, to provide somebody um, who can go on a quest to the north I don't know what it is but it starts in festal so that's how you basically then get the party started. So then we had a little exchange between the two. So she demands that he goes there and, you know, finds out stuff for her friend who lives in Festum, but she also wants him to write her regular updates. So he's going to start a little, you know, like book ledger that he's going to send over. He's going to write letters and, and whatnot. So he's now got this motivation. And... Um, so there was a lot of interaction between the two, so there was some chemistry going. So then I basically said, okay, you have to start moving. And I plotted the, the, um, the road for him. And um, I also realized that the group that will be playing um, lacks certain um, people. It doesn't have a healer, which is kind of problematic because if you can't heal, then, you know, um, recuperation in this game is very, very slow. You roll 1d6 per day, if you get enough rest and you could maybe, if you're unlucky, get one point of life back, you know, that's, that can be quite tricky. So I decided to give him a, an NPC that will travel with him um, to help this particular group out, but also to make sure that he has somebody to, you know, um, to go with because, um, it's nice to have a traveling companion. And I said, okay, well, she's going to uh, meet you around about here. She is, or well, probably more around about here. Um, and she has been a healer down here in the black um, lands where, where we have a lots of, um, lots of uh, issues um, and where we have um, another heptarch and it's, it's, it's really terrible. So essentially, um, uh, this is, this is the story, um, as it were. And then I sent him on his merry way. So he also um, had some interaction with his family. He had given me details about his family, so I worked that in. And then, essentially, the travels begin. And the travels then I shrank, because you don't have to talk about every single blade of grass that he sees. But you do have to think about what kind of interesting points would he encounter. And that's different from person to person. So he's from Lovangen. He's never left the city. Lovangen used to be a member of a five-city alliance, which was um, run over by the orcs in the third Orkenstorm, and since then has been um, uh, essentially um, uh, cut off from the rest. I mean, there is travel, there is um, trade between Lovangen and the rest of the world. However, there are orcs there that basically surround the city um, and demand tribute from the city once a year. And they will also attack um, people who, who, who travel there for, for trade. So it's, it's not the safest place. It's not like they're under siege. So it's not like there's a ring of, of um, siege engines around them or, you know, orcs ringing the city. But it is um, not even a watchful piece. It's a very uneasy piece and it can be broken any any minute. The orcs have now fallen apart again. There's not one orc empire. There are different orc tribes. Um, but, you know, they will just go rogue and just decide, oh, we need some money. Oh, we need some this. Oh, we need some that. Let's just attack some people. So he would not have come out of his shell of, of this of this uh, city before. So, um, but of course, he has been doing a lot of reading. So he has traveled the world in his mind. So you have to take this into account. So there will be things that he will know when he sees them because he remembers them, unlike other um, characters like um, the two from the north, the Fern Elf and the Fjarninger, um, who simply don't know anything. They come from almost an illiterate background. They do write, but not as <clears throat> other people do, and they definitely don't have libraries, and they don't have books that deal with anything that happens outside of their small um, areas simply because that's not what they do. I mean, some of them have traveled south. There are some, well, not Fjarningers, but there are some Fernels that, that have been um, traveling south, south and working there, but, you know, it's, it's, it's different. So then you have to bring this in and you have to think, okay, so what kind of cities are on their way to where he's going? And would he be interested in visiting them? And if he did, what would he see there? So again, you go back to your um, regional description and you have to think about, you know, if you can get a picture, that's nice. If you can get a, a map, that's even nicer. 
And then just basically try and think about, okay, so what would, be, what would he be interested in? So I always start with, what are the sites? Is there anything interesting about the city? Does it have nice temples? What kind of temples does it have? Does it have an opera? Does it have a theater? Does it have, it's got a marketplace because it's a city. So what kind of produce would they sell? Um, what is the local specialty with regard to food? What's the local specialty with regard to drink? So these are all the things that I, as a DM, need to know because the person might say, okay, well, I want to go and have nice dinner. Okay, so you go to a, to a restaurant. So what kind of food would you find there? Um, and um, so you always have to be aware of these things and you have to have the list ready. Then you also have to read through what kind of people he might want to meet or he could meet. I mean, depending on his standing, he is a mage, but he's only an Adeptus Mino, so he's not really an important one. He's from Lovangen. There is no connection between Lovangen and this place. So, you know, it's not like he would be visiting um, an allied city where he would be given, you know, like um, a warm welcome. They don't care. It's a big market city that he travels through. So, you know, he's just one of many travelers. So you have to bear all of this in mind. And this is how I basically structure those preludes um, to, um, and I also give room, and the most important thing is that I give the room to the person telling the story about themselves, telling the story about their character. Which brings me to one of the things, um, you know, how much of this is actually storytelling and how much of this is role playing with a double L, so how many Die, die rolls would I have and I have to say that when it comes I mean generally I don't like die rolling too much anyway there are areas when it's necessary let's say in a, in a in a battle situation because you do need to know did you hit did you not hit did you parry did you not parry but um um and how much damage did you do um but I think most of the time you can actually get away with telling the story or with somebody bringing up an idea saying, I'm going to try the following or I would like to do this. And if you think that this is something that they should easily be able to do because they've got the knowledge, they've got the skill level and so on and so forth, you know, they just succeed. I mean, they came up with an idea of what they were trying to do. Okay, so let's do this. Only when it comes to a point where the outcome isn't clear, where you can't say, yes, it's going to happen anyway. Yes, it's going to be successful or no, it's not going to be successful. It's not going to happen do you need to roll? Um, and I don't think we rolled a lot, if at all, in his prologue. Um, in other prologues where there was fighting, that happened. I know that one player went on a hunt, so we rolled there because we were almost using the focus rules, although not quite. Um, in one case, I was going to do a roll, but then the person came up with this brilliant idea of how they were going to prepare for a particular thing that they were going to do. They were going to climb... Um, an iced waterfall down the side of a mountain and they started to make implements and I was like okay so this is so brilliant she will definitely succeed because she has the stats to do a climb roll quite easily she also has points in it and she's also making herself tools so she doesn't need to roll but then there would have been other things if she had been for example afraid of the dead or dead bodies she would have had to roll on this because she was entering um, the cave of the dead so this is something where you really have to um, also think about does it make sense from a story point of view? And also bear in mind, what if the role doesn't succeed? How important is the role in the overall story that you're telling? Because you are at the moment telling a person's life story. It kind of also, um, in some cases, may bring them to the place where they are at now. So for example, if you are attacked by Vikings, you know, you're, you're, you're somewhere in, in Northern Germany and you're attacked by Vikings, but you already know that the person has survived because they're there to tell the story. Making rolls around, do they find you or do they hit you, do they kill you, doesn't make any sense. Because if the person loses the role and then gets killed, it sets the whole story um, to zero because then it can't have happened because they're here telling the story. So that kind of depends on how you do a prelude, if you basically take a prelude as well. So I had one where this guy, where this fern elf was being attacked by Fjarningas and his, his whole um, village was um, destroyed except for um, him and two or three other um, fern elves from his area. But of course, I didn't make him roll for hiding. I didn't make him roll for escaping because he had escaped. He had hidden successfully because he was telling the story. He was still alive. So that was more for a dramatic effect, explaining what do you see, how do you do it, but always assuming that, of course, his 
um, his um, whatever he's trying to do is successful because otherwise he would already have died. Um, and also in, in the case of the Fjallinger um, um, character, um, she has to learn how to, make, uh, how to make weapons using blood magic and she creates this really great battle axe for herself. And I didn't make her role because first of all, she has all of the specializations, but also it is what she does. She learns this. So this is a special situation where she is being taught by um, a master of the of the trade and she has all of the help she needs she has all of the implements she has all of the encouragement so she doesn't need to roll she will be successful because i know she will be and um, because she has to be because that's the story this is this is describing how she becomes the person she is today um and so um i think this is what you have to bear in mind when you create a prelude um for a character Again, the world comes first because anything you do has to correspond to the rules of the world. If the rules of the world are that no one can fly, they can't fly. If the rules of the world are that um, you can only travel from here to here after April or starting in April, then you have to start here. You can't just say, okay, we're going to start whenever. If the rule of the world tells you that a person going to, a, going to an academy here doesn't graduate until September, you have to find a way to spend September to April in a meaningful way. He could have traveled here straight away and then you could have, I could have come up with something to do here. But I just felt that more interesting things were going to happen in his home. I could have said, okay, well, you leave immediately, you are there and then you do stuff. But I felt that there was more interesting interaction between him and his family, between him and the people at the academy, in his home. That's a decision I made. I could have decided differently, but um, as I started reading up on the academy and the things that are there and the, and the people who are there and the NPCs that are there, I just felt that this was a lot more interesting. And um, while I didn't really play out those several months that he spent there as a teacher, so you didn't see him teach, you didn't see him prepare a class um, or, you know, that kind of thing. I just felt that this was a lot more um, rewarding for him as well, because um, although he has always been um, vilified by his friends, because, or, well, friends by, by, his, um, by his classmates, because he's so fat and everything, um, they were also just jealous of his mental abilities and of his academic achievement. But once he, he became a teacher himself, all of these things fell by the wayside and it was his academic achievement that stood out and that made him an important person, a person who's respected and so on. And I wanted the character to have this, this, um, this feeling as well. Um, and so I think it's always in my mind about how the characters feel. The characters need to... And I'm not saying that they should be cuddled, that they should have it easy, that, you know, you should, you should give them respect, you, should, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't put them through difficult things. Um, but the characters need to feel that whatever happens is kind of in character. That if something happens that they don't expect and they make a decision for their character to react in a certain way, that first of all, this reaction is accepted by the DM, but also that it has consequences. Those consequences can be negative, but it has to have consequences that are in keeping, again, with the world and with the adventure. So um, that's how I created one of the four preludes that we've played, and um, I hope you found this video useful. If you've got any other questions, just let me know. Bye.